Hello everybody, my name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author and robot and today we're gonna talk about kind of just what my writing uh, routine is to go from draft to finished project and maybe it can help you out, maybe it'll give you ideas on what to try next. But before we get started, and number one, check out Lemoy down in the description below on Thursday, we're going to have September's Lemoy video. So there is a new prompt down there for October, the one year anniversary to Lemoy on this channel. And I love reading what you guys write every month. So um, whenever you guys submit. So the other thing is pitch fit. If you, if you are a creative, an indie creative especially, and you would like your work pitched on this channel, hopefully reuniting or uniting for the first time readers and um, creatives doing this thing. Check out that, pitch me your story and I will pitch it here. The next Pitch Fit video will be at the end of September, so check that out and that is really all that's going on. So, all that said, let's get into it. There are a lot of different ways that you can tackle writing. I know one of the biggest traps that people fall into, specifically for novels, is they like to just rewrite the same opening chapters again and again and again and again until it is perfect. And I know so many people that do that, I know somebody who has been working on like the first three to five chapters for like 15 years at least, and she doesn't move on. You need to finish your first draft. You just need to do it. I know that there is no one size fits all answer for anything, but if you've been working on the same book for 15 years because you keep rewriting the beginning, I, I have to recommend that you just try to finish it. Don't take that as law though, that is just <laughs> so you don't go crazy, okay? But there are so many different ways in which you can approach your manuscript and get it from beginning to end. And so don't take what I say in this video as any you have to do it this way, but rather this is just the way that I do it. And maybe it will benefit you to see how I work through my problems or I organize my drafting. And maybe it'll inspire you to figure out different ways to try working on your routine or method. What's the, what's the word that I want? Your, um, Methodology isn't even the word I want, but hopefully you get what I'm saying. <laughs> Sometimes seeing what other people do helps make things happen. The first stage of a novel is obviously the first draft. And so the project that I'm working right now is the second book in the Bleed More, Body More trilogy. Either, I'm not entirely sure on the name yet. I have an idea, but I have to finish the actual book before, I, so I can know what the elements of it are. Um, I use Scrivener to do my first draft and my second draft. You can use whatever program you want. And I know everybody always goes all on and on about Scrivener because I didn't used to like it and then I tried this newer version and I actually do like this version for a couple of different reasons. Uh, so I'll show you what I exactly I do and how I methodology through all of my stuff. So if you look to the left, You'll see I've, under manuscript, I've got act one and act two. Usually I break my books into three acts and those three acts may not necessarily be traditional act breaks, but they are always consistent with some major change in the character's life. And so, or um, in the, the action of the story. I'm not entirely sure even if this is where chapter seven should, or where act two should start, but something big just happened in the story and um, we're about to go into a new direction. They might still be in act one. I honestly just moved seven down in a second, like yesterday. But anyway, the way that I usually figure this out is I figure out where the starting point of my book is. Um, and one of the first major points that I need them to get to in the storyline. And so in this case, um, we start, the, the book begins where Bleed More, Body More ends. And the first thing that I need to happen is somebody's house gets burned down. So I have to go from the beginning or yeah, from the ending of book one to that other moment. And that's what all of these chapters in between are. It's doing everything that's necessary to get from one place to the next. Um, I also keep notes of different where my arcs are and kind of vari variations of different things that I want to happen in the chapters. And before I've actually determined where they fit in chapter orientation, I kind of just drop all of that stuff in this arches arcs in this in this arcs folder or in this notes folder so then that's how I build it out and then as I figure out the ordering or what I need in the different chapters I then start adding chapters here I'm still working on chapter seven 
even though you'll see a chapter eight here. And that's because I know kind of where I want chapter eight to take place. And as I figure out more and more what comes next, I'll just start dropping in chapters to tell me where to go next. And probably by the time I hit and I'm working on chapter eight, I'll know quite a bit more of where act two needs to go. And then I'll start planning act three. And all of my stuff usually starts forming as I'm working on the chapter. Uh, sometimes I'm much better about knowing this is act one, this is the act two seismic toss, and this is the act three seismic toss, like with boom, boom, boom coming out in May. That one was pretty easy. And those shifts are pretty large because it was like get from Ukraine to United States. And then it was escape the feds and meet the girl. And then I'm not going to spoil the last site, you know, the mega, the mega climax. But you could see the shifts in the main character's life and those fairly easy, um, basically in his surroundings. So anyway, I go through and I just work out these chapters. I write them as bullet points, the, what I want to happen or where they're set as bullet points. And then I just write through the chapters the way that I actually meter my work. And I have a lot of people that are like, don't do it that way. But <laughs> this is just how I do it is I actually set a daily word goal for myself. I don't like to write for a certain amount of time because that doesn't necessarily like work for me. I like to see logistical changes and have something trackable. And that's one of the things that I like about this newer version of Scrivener is that the older version did not have this, but you can check your writing history and then you can, oh, that's embarrassing. Yeah, don't look at those. This month has been kind of a loss, but that's, that's how it always is when I start a new project. First month of a new project is usually just like, but I usually set a writing goal for the day. And then that becomes when I know that I'm done working on it. And you can do that, you can specifically do that inside of Scrivener where you have your session target and you just do the settings so that says session ends at the end of the day. So then you know, you just gotta hit that number by the end of the day. And um, is the manuscript target actually 80,000? No, but it's the minimum short that I think it's going to be. Uh, body more one was around 90,000 words. So I think this one will probably be around the same length, but I'm just doing, a goal to reach for so I can see as I go. And if, as I get closer, and if this manuscript appears to be getting longer, I'll move that manuscript goal to be bigger. Anyway, that just gives me an end goal and being able to see that bar move and see myself get closer and see the numbers of the 30,000 to the 80,000 or the four, you know, seeing myself at the 50%, actually seeing those logistical changes every day really helps me to stay motivated and to feel like I'm doing something. Because sometimes when you're working on a manuscript or especially a first draft, you can feel like you're just spinning wheels and you're just like digging dirt and putting it into a hole that is never being filled. And being able to, when, one of the cool things on this guy is the bottom bar, when you have a daily goal, the bottom bar fills with blue as you get that too. So you've got a constant visual reminder that one, you're working daily and then you're working masterly on a bigger thing. So that is my draft one. Stage two is the revision. So let's break down what the three major changes are in a novel. Draft, draft one is to make it exist. Draft two is to make it functional. And draft three is to make it effective. And usually in my draft one manuscripts, the ending is kind of rushed and it's kind of bare. And I usually add a lot more to the end by the time I'm working on draft two because I think by the time I hit the end of draft one, I'm kind of just like, oh my gosh, end it. Even if I'm enjoying the book, I'm like, I just need to end this so I can go back and... <laughs> Pretty sure with this book, I added, I think this book was originally around like 84,000 when I finished it first draft. And I know I might be confusing it with something else. I know that Boom 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 had like 10,000 extra words on top and I completely changed a scene or two on that one in draft two. This one uh, for Body, Bleed More, Body More 1 was fairly good, but I did make some decent changes in some scenes and relationships changed mostly in draft two. Anyway, the way that I deal with draft two, I'm going to grab a different book that's already set up in the way that I approach draft two. So Creatures Lie Here is a book that I wrote a couple of years ago. I think I started it in 2017 ish. And it's been through a couple revisions. Um, I've grown as a writer since I revised it last. And it kind of needs, Alan needs some help. Okay. Um, so when I work on draft two, you'll see over here on the left side of my screen. Now you've got under manuscript act one, and then under act two or under research, you see a revision two, and you see these other acts. 
So when I finish a manuscript, I just move that whole of all of the manuscripts that are up here into research and I open blank documents under manuscript and I just start rewriting literally everything. So you'll see this has act one, two, and three, but up here in the active manuscript, there is only an act one. And that's because I've only rewritten chapter, the prologue, chapter one, and part of chapter two. So then the way that I approach my revision one is I get to, and I put all of my, I put all of my changing notes here at the top underneath my header. On the right side of the screen, this is my older version that I'm going off of. On the left side of my screen, this is the newer version that I'm going off. So I will, you'll see that these are all struck out and anything that I've struck out, I've either rewritten already or I've written past it and I'm not using it anymore. Um, if you see this, you see where it's not struck out, but it's between strikeouts. That means I'm either holding it to use later or I'm considering using it. Um, if I don't use it at all, then I usually strike it out. But something like that is usually telling me, hey, I wanted to remember to use this somewhere. But so that comes down to, I just have to find where I'm at, your brothers. And so then by having it side by side, when I'm doing a draft too, it's just completely rewriting word for word and changing stuff as I go. So in this case, I'm starting at your brothers, the orderly. So that's really all that I'm going to rewrite, but you can kind of compare. Uh, this is about almost as far as I got ish in rewriting over here. And when I'm doing revision, I'm think of, think of it as um, making a bed. And so draft one is the base of the bed. Draft two is you're laying the fitted sheet on the bed, which means you've got to flatten it out. You got to straighten out, make sure there are no problems with it. And so then I go through it and I look for like this right here. It just said it was a dark room, but then it also says large windows are illuminating the area. So I clean that up. I fix anything, since I learn a lot of uh, things about the story as I write through the story and I figure out what I need to set up earlier on as I write further, um, I rewrite the story from the beginning thinking of what that character's personality is now that I know them better and also about any of the details I learned later on what I need to plant now. And so then I'm, tell, a lot of the time, I'm rewriting whole scenes, I'm rewriting characters' relationships because they've changed. With this story specifically, Creatures Lie Here, every time I've revised, Alan has changed fairly drastically. <laughs> and I think the, um, the tenses changed as well because I've gone from third to first, no, yeah, I think this used to be third person. Maybe, no, maybe it didn't. Now, but it did go from past tense to present tense to past tense to present tense. And I obviously, I like to write first person in present tense. I know a lot of you hate that, but you know, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, but in the first draft, he was single. In the second draft, he was dating somebody. In the third draft, he was engaged. And in the fourth revision draft, he is married. And that's where I'm at right now is he is married and his wife wants a child and he's not ready for that responsibility. And so he kind of uses getting himself in on this job um, and then put away in a mental institute for this job for the newspaper to get away from his wife so he doesn't have to talk about having children with her yet. <laughs> this is in the 1950s and he's like 23. And so it's like, you're kind of expected to have children and be working on that. But he's just like, I'm working on a career. I'm working on a journalist career. I don't want it. But so, learning more about his relationship with his wife, Kate, at, with every revision, I have to go back and change the interactions. And obviously at some point since he was single and then he got Kate, I had to add an entire another character who would come in before he went into the asylum. So things like that can change. And that's one of the things I discover as I rewrite. Some, some scenes or scenarios can be shifted totally because characters might make different decisions during revision. And that's kind of what I've figured out. So you can have more than one revisive, I don't know if that's a real word, but a revisive draft. If you get to the end of your revision one and you go, oh, I think I need to do it again, then I would just do the same thing I always do, which would be grab my three, three act folders, just grab my whole manuscript folder, drop it down there, label it correctly, and then get started on the next draft, starting with a zero, uh, with a blank document rewrite again. 
Uh, if you want to see what I do when it's a brand new chapter, so it's really not any different. You can probably expect it. Oops, this side needs to be the three. This side needs to be the old three. And then you'll see chapter three, and I will just start from there. And that's pretty much just what I do, is now I'm started on this next thing. And fortunately, since I've written in this, you can see what I was talking about with showing the daily requirements. Um, this really works you can, if you look at this guy. Oops. If you look at this guy, you'll see that it's set to 1667, which is the requirement, the daily requirement if you're doing NaNoWriMo. So this really helps if you want to be kept on track for that. But um, just seeing that number move as I devote time to it really helps me because then I'm like, okay, this is my minimum for today. And then after I hit my minimum, I can keep writing if I feel like writing. Bada bing, bada boom. And uh, I like seeing those numbers move. That is how it goes. Then once I'm done with that, it's time to move on to stage three. Once you're done with your revising and you're like, okay, the, the blankets are all laid flat. I like how these characters are coming out mostly. I don't have any major plot issues that I can see. Everything is fitting together. Then we are moving on to line edits and copy edits. Now I don't move on to line edits or copy edits until I am more or less happy with the way that the overall book is. I don't focus on getting really pretty lines or the pace of stuff too much when I'm doing the earlier drafts of things, um, draft one or revision. Usually character voices start coming out and I'm just normally writing whatever that sounds like because I came up with American Fat for Boom 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 in version one. But some things get much cleaner, sound much better once I'm done with revision. So the line edit and the copy edit can be combined and you're probably gonna wanna do it more than once, but this whole stage is just about making your book really readable, so much better. And it might end up actually um, combining with the making it more effective because as you change lines and clean stuff up, you're probably gonna see some improvement in the emotionality of what you're writing and the emotional power of what you're writing, maybe in some of the personalities that you're writing. Um, I've noticed with particularly Boom, since that was the last book that I revised and edited, that character voices came out more. And sometimes even once I was done with the re with the editing and line edit process, I'd come up with more things for characters to say. So I'd just go in and drop that information in there. So now you're gonna see me switch again to another manuscript for uh, talking about the line and copy edits. I no longer work in Scrivener when I get to the line edit and copy edit portion. I actually start working in Microsoft Word. So from there, you would export your book from whatever other instrument you're using, in this case, from Scrivener and put it on Microsoft Word. And then you would start formatting it for however you want it to be because I can't ever figure out how to get Scrivener to export in exactly the format that I like. So I clean it up, get my page breaks. This At this point, you're gonna see boom, boom, boom in manuscript form because currently I have it formatted for paperback. Uh, so ignore that. But once I get to this point, uh, my line edits, when I'm doing line edits and copy edits, I usually have a text to speech because I listen to the way something sounds, I listen to the pacing, I listen to um, the beats and the rhythm and everything and, and anything that might be too repetitive in a bad way in a sentence. And it's much easier to hear the lyricism of something or the rhythm of something if it is text to speech uh, or if you're reading it out loud. And with a theater background, I don't know how many other authors specifically focus on this, but with the theater background, I very, very much focus on having something that sounds very conversational, very natural. And my writing, I think, kind of has a different pace at times. Uh, so you're gonna see here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what it sounds like for a little bit. I only use the free voices that come with the computer and I usually use Zira, but this is kind of how it goes when I'm doing my line edits. I take the cereal box out of the shipping container. Frigid Flakes. It's a dark blue box with a person wearing a light blue parka pulled over their head. All of there are features. Their skin is pale and they're beady. Black eyes stare out from the hood opening. The person... So you see it just tripped on all of, all of there are features. That's obviously something is missing there. Over their head. I think that's covering all of there. Of... There. I don't know what was going on in that sentence. I know I, I know I received notes on it and I edited it. Um, <laughs> apparently I only half edited it or something. Covering all of their features. Their skin is pale and they're 
beady black eyes stare out from the hood opening. Yeah, and so that's basically how it goes. And I will listen to it, and if something catches me, either a phrase doesn't sound correct, or if it sounds too long-winded, if I notice that something is being a run-on sentence that's not really working out in the way that I thought it would lyrically work, um, I'll say it out loud myself, and I'll try to find the pauses or the emphases that I was looking for, and if I can't find it, then I'll make changes to that sentence, either making it shorter, breaking it up, any of those things. And that's what my line edits or co and copy edit draft looks like. At this time, that is not all that is in here, but those are my main focuses. If I'm working through this book and I discover, hey, I could add this line in or this character should say this, then I will add minor changes like that in there, but I'm not gonna do any overhauling in this phase of the book. I'm just adding lines, removing lines, and checking the flow of all of the text. Now, once I have done that, we have ended stage three and we're going into stage four. Uh, stage four of the manuscript for me is getting my first readers and critique partners that are, they know me, they know my voice, they typically know what I'm kind of going for, and they're the first people that see what I'm working on. They're the ones that I test the script out against because I don't think that they're going to look at it and then tell me to rewrite it in their form because I know them. Now, I don't have a whole ton of people like this. I have only two or three, maybe, and they're the people that I get my first impression from. I see how the story works with them. I see if they spot any major things that stand out. And I take their suggestions in different ways, depending on what they say and what my goals are. So this is the point when it's very important to very be very selective with who your first readers are. They need to understand you, your style, and have a devotion, not a devotion, but have a respect for you, your voice as an author and not try to rewrite what you're doing. Because if you get into a big writing group, you're gonna have so many different styles of critiquing with some people saying you should write like me with other people not really helping out a whole lot and other people who are casual readers and you'll get more of a casual reader response or just a, hey, this was good because a lot of people in um, larger critique groups just say, hey, this was good or hey, this was not good. So your first readers and your first critique partners, after you've gotten it to the level in which you think that you can't take it any further, they should be people who are looking for what you're trying to accomplish, and then they should be helping you figure out how to get it there sooner. Now, your first readers may not understand specifically everything that you've put in there, but they should be trying to get your perspective on it and be working towards helping you with more clarity and more strength. In the case of this book, um, one of my first readers was a curly hair checker because she has curly hair <laughs> and she made some jet suggestions and caught on to some things that is actually what I meant because I said combing the hair back a couple of times when I did actually mean pushing the hair back and she talked about what it's like when you comb your hair when it's curly and it's just getting frizzy and so every time I went and looked for that. She pointed out a number of other things. She also is, she was um, the person that I credit a lot for some of the sharpness that Dead End Drive ended up with because she made some major suggestions for um, bloat. A lot of, a lot of Car Matthias character but bloat in Dead End Drive and uh, her suggestions for that book made it so much better. But I also received some bad suggestions from other various critique partners for that book who didn't really get the style of the comedy and the horror. So it's very important to get a small group of people for your first readers, your critique partners, to really get down what you're trying to do in this book. And then once you've done that, you'll get your feedback from them. That might be line edit, that might be, I like this. This might be, hey, this is something to think about. And they might give you perspective that you didn't realize was being put off in your story that you can gauge, okay, was that their experience that was influencing that? Or did I put those hints in there and without realizing that I put those hints in there? So there are so many different things that your first readers will be able to help you with, specifically with clarity and with character and testing how your story plays. Um, and if it is exciting enough, if it makes sense, all of that noise. Um, after I've received the feedback from my critique partners, from my first readers, I make those edits and suggestions, and then the book moves on to stage five. Stage five is line edits and copy edits again, because once you've started working in your manuscript again, kind of like I just showed you with that sentence that was messed up at the beginning, how does that happen? Um, but once you start messing with your manuscript again, it's very important that you do a head to top to bottom edit once more. Um, 
to make sure that you don't have any hanging lines because that's really what happens when you start editing your manuscript. That's, uh, that's how Dead End Drive got very, very messy, especially because it was a long-term project over a lot of years and I moved stuff around and I changed stuff and I forgot that I changed stuff. When you, so, so you do a top to bottom edit one more time after you make all of your edits and suggestions from your partners. And then you can either resubmit it to those partners to have another read to see how, how your changes worked, if they've got any more suggestions, or you can hold on to that and start querying it or getting it ready for publication, whichever way you wanna go. I did want to mention one more thing with the line edit and the copy edit for how my methodologies have changed because between Dead and Drive and Bleed More, Body More, my editing prowesses changed slightly. I, I have been slowly over the last couple of months finding like one-liners all over the place for Body More that I'm like, oh, I can clean that up and make it better. But with Bleed More, Body More, I have had z absolutely zero comments on editing from my ARC readers, which was not the case for Dead End Drive. And I don't even blame them for doing that on Dead End Drive because Dead End Drive was kind of messy. So um, not only do I do the text to speech read through with this, I also do the, the editor that's on Microsoft Word for spelling. And I don't have to make all of the changes, obviously. I just have to look for what makes sense. Tak is, these are all Ukrainian. Yakiv is Ukrainian. That is also Ukrainian. So I just have to go through and do those. And then once I'm done with the Microsoft Word editor, I also use the Grammarly Basic editor, which actually finds different things in Microsoft Word than the Microsoft Word editor finds. And so by combining these two things together, it has helped make a much more accurate. They both watches. They both have watches. What do you want to change that to? They both have watched. No, they have watches. So again, you're going to want to uh, keep your eyes on what the editor is telling you to do. But by doing both of them, you'll catch different things. Like the Grammarly guy was catching sentences that ended early that the Microsoft Word editor didn't catch. And when I went back to do the Grammarly edit on Dead and Drive, it caught quite a few things that the Microsoft Word editor did not catch. So then you make those smaller edits, those copy edits with the two editors, and then you can start getting it ready for either querying for small press publication or for indie publishing. Though, uh, and or, if not indie publishing, um, your ARC readers. So, or your larger crit group. If you wanted to try it out on a bigger group than your first readers before you start editing it more, because then you can get a bigger consensus. The thing to keep in mind with either of those, however, is whenever you submit your manuscript to outside readers for feedback, the best thing that you can do for yourself is to know what you're trying to do with the book, the voice or the purpose that you're trying to have for it overall, and to maybe ask the readers specific questions to say, hey, did these things make sense? Did these things happen? Was this effective? And then gauge the feedback that you get based on what your goals were, because the bigger the net you throw your book out to for um, feedback or review, the more likely you are to hit readers that aren't your target readers. So they may not read your book the way that other people in your genre or who enjoy your genre would. The biggest giveaway for this is whenever you submit a book that is like even slightly fantasy and sci-fi, and maybe you have some made up words in there, and then you hand it to people who do not read sci-fi or fantasy, and they start questioning all of your made up words, and they're like, but if you hand it to, and they're very confused, I had somebody in a, in a crit group that I went to, I had a made up word in there, I said it was a made up thing, uh, I explained what it was in the context of the story, and then their feedback for me was, hey, I don't know what this word is, I googled it, and it, nothing came up in relation to a humanoid robot being called this. Yeah. So <laughs> if you know what you're trying to accomplish and at least some level of, is this a YA book, an adult book, a middle grade book, and the different conventions that you can get away with and any of those things, then it's easier to gauge which feedback is helpful and which ones are from readers who understand your genre and which ones don't. You can get really lost in the feedback that you get if you don't know what you're looking for, if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish, and if you try to appease everybody. There is no appeasement of everybody if you're trying to write something specific and if you 
maybe even if you don't know what it is you're trying to accomplish, but you have the goal of this is a sci-fi and I need to make sure that this thing about this main character is clear, you need to know those things before handing your book to somebody who is not one of your first or trusted readers, because you're gonna get a lot of feedback that may or may not make sense to what you're trying to do. So that is the whole of the stages one through five that I have for when I'm preparing a manuscript and how I move it from stage to stage and my methodologies in combating all of these different things. Let me know what your methodologies are from stage from draft to finish down in the comments below. And let me know if there are any subjects that you would like me to cover, if there's anything that I can do to make your writing journey easier or to give ideas for how to combat troubles that you might be having. With all of that said, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like it, share it, subscribe for more, and have a great, happy Monday. Don't die. The only people who should come are those who want to meet their monsters. If this is what Agatha wants, I don't know how we can even dispute it. I change lives, baby. And I end them. Sweetheart, no bargains hold. Only fools know restraint. Only losers lose! I've been under the knife so many times, I'm practically immune to it. If your scissors are dull, May I recommend sharpening them with leather? I think I hit you. Bimal says I must have a guardian angel. To enter the ring but abstain from playing is suicidal. Your virtue makes you nothing but a liability. You're gonna die. You're gonna die. You're gonna die.